Good evening, everybody. You guys can kind of quiet down. Uh, I'm going to be quick because I know you guys are very excited about tonight's speaker. Um, I'm Erin Roberts. I run the Young Professionals Group here at the Chicago Council. We are so glad that all of you guys could come out tonight. Um, just a reminder to silence your phone, but not your voice. Um, we invite you to tweet with us tonight. The Twitter handles are on the sheets on your uh, chairs, and we'll be taking some questions from Twitter. We are live streaming tonight, so if there's anybody watching from afar that wants to tweet in a question, we'll be paying attention. Um, bringing your attention to a few upcoming programs, uh, our actual, the next YP program is this uh, Friday with Tom Anderson talking about the value of debt. Fortunately, it's sold out, but we are running a, a wait list for it. So, um, On April 17th, we have Wendy Kopp from Teach for America. And there's a special promotion for young professionals. If you use the code EDUCATION, you can attend for free. And then on April 23rd, we have Jean-Claude Druchet. And there's going to be a YP meetup after that one down at ARIA. So hopefully we'll see you at one of those programs. Um, and of course, pay attention to the website. There's lots of uh, exciting updates coming up. You'll see one coming up very soon. You guys are the first to know, but we're going to have a YP party after our May program with Timothy Geithner and Hank Paulson, and it's actually going to be on the stage, so stay tuned for that. Um, and to get us started, I'm going to actually invite Mike Merwin up. He is a director circle member here at the council and a partner at Ernst & Young, and he's going to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Aaron. It's a pleasure to be here to, in the evening with, for the council and the Young Professionals Group. It'd be a bigger pleasure if I still qualified to be a member. <laughs> uh, but it's a great honor, nonetheless, to introduce an impassioned young man also, uh, Matt Taibbi, for a discussion about wealth gap in America. By many different economic measures, the wealth gap in, or income inequality around the world and in America has been increasing dramatically. The World Economic Forum identified income inequality as a major global risk over the next decade. And we're already seeing the effects in social unrest in many regions of the world. Here in the U.S., we have an all-time low percentage of wages as total U.S. income, while corporate profits are at a peak. And in Chicago here, we're a microcosm of these world and U.S. events. Chicago recently rate, rated eighth in income inequality amongst 50 cities in the U.S., according to a Brookings Institute report. So with those kind of events in the background, we're very fortunate tonight to have Matt here, fresh from his daily show report. <laughs> to share with us his thoughts on income inequality in the U.S., its factors, and what we can do about the wealth gap in America. So please join me in extending a warm Midwest welcome to Matt. Hi. Um, First of all, thank you to all of you. Thank you to the council for having me. This is a, a tremendous honor to be invited here. Um, I think if you had told me 20 years ago that I'd be addressing the Council on Foreign Affairs uh, in Chicago, I'd, I'd probably think I was having an acid flashback. Um, and also, the size of the crowd is, is really impressive. It's funny, a couple of weeks ago, I, I also did a speech. and. Um, before I went up on the podium, I, I asked the moderator, I said, wow, how did you get so many people to come here? And he says, oh, we told everybody you were Ben Bernanke. <laughs> so, so if you're expecting somebody else, I'm sorry. Uh, but, um, but I'm happy to be here. So um, again, as, as alluded to, the subject tonight is uh, income inequality. Uh, and in particular, uh, another kind of inequality, which is criminal justice inequality, which is what I've been spending the last two or three years working on uh, fairly extensively. And there's really no way for me to kind of delve into this topic without talking about my own personal journey to getting to cover uh, this particular issue. Uh, because five or six years ago, I was basically just a regular campaign trail political reporter uh, whose job it was to make fun of politicians for a living. Um, I had absolutely no expertise in this area. I knew, knew nothing about Wall Street. I uh, couldn't balance my own checkbook um, and didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, but I was sort of 
forced by accident uh, to end up in this area. And it all started really in the summer of 2008. Uh, and I can actually pinpoint the date. It was September, September 3rd, 2008. Um, a lot of you actually remember that day because that was the day that Sarah Palin gave her famous speech at the Republican National Convention. Does everyone remember that speech? Yeah, I'm gonna show of hands how many people remember that, that day. So I was there that day with all the other campaign trail reporters and uh, I remember uh, watching this speech, you know, with fascination and thinking to myself, this, um, this, is, this person is going to be an important factor in national politics and I'm trying to think of all of the cliches that, would, that I would use in my, you know, sort of boilerplate political analysis of what had just happened. And I went back to the filing room, which if there are any journalists in this audience, the filing room is basically always this windowless cage where they shove the reporters uh, after an event and they, that, that's where you go to write your story. And I'm, I'm sitting in the filing room and I'm about to start writing about Sarah Palin and I start surfing the internet and I see all these headlines, these sort of obscure, um, uh, very vaguely written uh, news articles about how the international economy is on the verge of total collapse uh, and we may be heading into a depression the likes of which none of us have ever seen before uh, but nobody could really explain in any of these news stories what the actual causes were uh, of, of, the, uh, of the crisis. And I remember um, very clearly looking at the re reporter who was sitting next to me, um, and I'll, I'll leave him nameless, but I'll just say that it's a, it's a well-known person who works for an East Coast daily newspaper. Uh, and I, I said to this person, um, hey, have you noticed that, you know, like the world is ending? And, uh, <laughs> And I said, um, do you understand any of this subprime stuff? And he looked back at me, and this is, I'll never forget this. He goes, like that. Like that, that was his response. That was the cream of the American press corps' response to uh, the subprime mortgage crisis. It, just, it wasn't worth looking into. Uh, basically, political reporters have one way of covering the economy, or if unemployment's down, that's good. If the stock market's up, that's good. Uh, and if it's good news, we say we congratulate whoever's in office, and uh, then we go to the other party for a comment, and they talk about how this, the statistics six or lies and then we just sort of write that up and throw that out there and that's that's the extent of how we covered covered economics but I was very bothered by this moment because it occurred to me uh, that among other things Sarah Palin's speech was all about the economy or a lot was significantly about the economy which was imploding before my very eyes and um, I knew nothing about it and uh, even though it's normal in journalistic circles to pretend to be an expert about things we, we know absolutely nothing about, um, I decided sort of on my own to start investigating what was going on. And I, I had terrible trouble trying to understand uh, what the subprime mortgage crisis was about. None of the news articles really put it in clear language. Uh, and I, I took out all these, I bought all these books on economics. I read everything from Hayek to The Wealth of Nations to Milton Friedman to, uh, and I called up economists and spoke to Wall Street analysts and none of them could make any sense of it for me. It didn't, it didn't uh, register at all. And then finally I found this guy on the internet who basically wrote, he made cartoons uh, about banks. Um, that was his hobby and his day job. He was actually a trader for one of the biggest banks in, in, in the world, uh, but he wrote these very nasty cartoons about, about the business. And then I asked him, like, look, I'm at the end of my rope. Can you help me? Uh, he took me out to lunch. And I explained to him my dilemma, and he says, your problem is that you're covering this as, as an economic story. This is not an economic story, it's a crime story. Uh, and he started to explain to me, and without going too far into this, because of this is sort of a little bit far afield of the topic of the evening, basically the subprime mortgage crisis ha had its roots in changes in the mortgage markets. In the old days, uh, you know, a bank would only lend a mortgage to someone who was a good credit risk because that bank was going to be holding on to that loan. Uh, what happened prior to the last crash was they, the new innovations had, had 
come around that essentially allowed banks to transfer that risk uh, onto investors. So instead of lending to one person, they would lend to a thousand people. They would take those thousand mortgages, they would put them in a pool, they would chop them up, make them into securities, sell those securities to inv investors who very frequently were institutional investors like pension funds or foreign trade unions or hedge funds or whoever. Basically, they were taking, uh, they were going out and giving mortgages to everybody with a pulse, uh, making these pools of mortgages, uh, chopping them up into securities, and then they were using these new innovations like collateralized debt obligations, um, plus their influence with the ratings agencies to disguise the poor quality uh, of these mortgages, um, which they would then sell, uh, immediately sell off to their investors and to their clients. Um, and so as I'm being told this story, I was having lunch in Chinatown with this, this gentleman who was explaining this, all, this, this to me, and he, he said, look out the window. And I look out the window, and there's, um, uh, in Chinatown, the, the typical scene, uh, some people are uh, selling phony Prada handbags out of the back of, a, uh, of the trunk of a car uh, to tourists who are passing by. And he goes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That, that's the crisis right there. Instead of phony Prada bags, it's phony AAA rated mortgages. And instead of tourists, it's pensioners and foreign trade unions and foreign hedge funds. And that's all you need to know. Um, and so I started buying all these books about crime, and from that from that point forward, the whole thing became crystal clear to me. The, the, like all, all these capers that I had read about and couldn't understand, they, they became sen sensible to me after that. And so I wrote all these stories uh, for a couple of years about all these various things that had gone on on Wall Street that were unsavory. And I started to notice that at the at the end of all of them, they all had the same punchline, which was that. Um, well, first of all, all my stories are the same. They're all like 6,000 or 7,000 words long. Uh, and then at the end of it, it's like in this clever fashion, this evil company stole gazillions of dollars. Uh, and then after that, there was always the same punchline, which, which is nobody got indicted, nobody goes to jail. And I started to become very troubled by that. Uh, how is it possible that no, none of these people are being prosecuted for what turns out to be uh, a common crime? And the reason, again, I started off with that story is, is to point out the fact that this is not some, it was not a mere technical violation. It was not overzealousness. These, this was just common, ordinary garden variety crime. It was just done on a scale that none of us had ever seen before. Uh, and it was done in a way that was much cleverer than most of us were used to seeing. And I, uh, so I started as, trying to ask the question of, of why nobody was going to jail. And I, and I remember I had this uh, moment where I talked to a former federal prosecutor uh, in Washington, and I, I was talking about a, um, a, a, a subprime mortgage company that, that let's say, had created um, uh, many uh, billions of dollars of toxic loans that ultimately we, the US government had to repurchase. And so they were a major cause of the bailout, uh, but the, the the CEOs and the officers of this company um, did not face, not only did they not face uh, any criminal penalties, but they got to keep all of, all of the money that they made during this period. And I asked this prosecutor, I said, how is it th that you know, an ordinary person who, who goes into a liquor store and sticks his hand in a cash register and pulls out $200 goes to jail, but these people who stole billions of dollars uh, don't even go to trial. And he looked at me and he said, uh, and again, I talked about this in The Daily Show last night, but he looked at me and he said, are you crazy? Have you been to jail? Jails are dangerous. Uh, you know, people get stabbed in jails. And it was, it was an important, for me, psychological moment because it, it, it said a lot about what the thinking was behind a lot of these decisions to not prosecute um, a lot of these people. Uh, they, th there's a d clear distinction that many of the people in the law enforcement uh, arena now draw between the people who committed the, the, the offenses at these sort of financial companies. And again, they're not everybody. It's just a small group of bad apples at a lot of these companies for the most part. And it's really just a few companies when you really look at it. Um, uh, and they draw a distinction between those people uh, who they see um, as having merely broken a few rules and everybody else uh, who uh, is in the criminal justice system who are real criminals who do things like uh, 
uh, hold up liquor stores and steal cars and perhaps uh, commit acts of prostitution. Those are crimes, whereas these other things are violations. They're in this nebulous territory that, um, that doesn't demand jail time. And so I thought this was a, uh, this is when I decided to start to write this book because uh, I, I had lived in the Soviet Union. Uh, I, I'm old enough to have gone to college actually in Leningrad. Uh, and I remember living in a society that had two sets of rules. Uh, you know, I would go to school in the morning and there would be a kid who was trying to trade blue jeans with all the foreign students and that kid would get, get picked up by the police once a day. Uh, and then, of course, the head of the director of the university would come to work five minutes later dressed in a foreign suit or dressed in blue jeans and would stroll right past the same policeman and, of course, nothing would happen to that person. And uh, what I learned very quickly is that the Soviets had internalized this entire second set of laws that had nothing to do with the actual written laws, that they, they understood implicitly that one, set, one kind of person goes to jail, one kind of person gets arrested, and another kind of person does not get arrested. And I, I started to wonder, is that, is that happening with us? And I, so what I ended up having to do is, once again, um, uh, as I'd had to get myself up to speed about how the financial services sector worked, I now had to learn about how the courts worked and how the criminal justice system worked because I didn't really know anything about that. I wanted to make this comparison between the lack of prosecutions um, against these Wall Street offenders uh, and everybody else who goes to jail. And so I had to learn who was going to jail, how they were going to jail, um, and how those processes worked. And I immediately learned that there were major, major built-in, baked-in inequities in the system uh, that are unknown to most Americans. And I, I know this is supposed to be a short address, so I'm going to make this as quick as possible, but I'll just list four of them because they're, they're really important. Um, the first one has to do with bail. Uh, bail for a white-collar offender uh, who's accused of some, anything south of murder or uh, perhaps a Bernie Madoff scale Ponzi scheme, uh, bail is basically an irrelevancy because they can afford any, any bail. Uh, and it's seldom imposed anyway, uh, as I found out in most of these cases, mainly because none of these cases ever reached the criminal stage in the first place. Uh, but bail just simply isn't a factor. But for the ordinary street criminal, bail is a huge factor. Um, and there's a saying in courts, I started to spend a lot of time in courts, there's a saying that defense lawyers have, which is that um, if you get out, you stay out. In other words, if you're, if you're at your bail hearing and you manage to somehow either make bail or get re released on your own recognizance, if you get out, you stay out. If you go in, you stay in. In other words, the whole thing is all about bail. If you can't make bail, you're going to lose your case. If you can make bail, you can fight it and you can win. Um, judges, that there's also a thing, a phenomenon that I discovered called nuisance bail, uh, which uh, it turns out that if you go to a lot of these uh, courtrooms, you'll find that there's a lot of questioning about how, how much uh, the defendant on trial, uh, what, is, what kind of assets he or she may have, and the judge uh, may consistently impose what they call nuisance bail, which is just enough money that the person can't afford and, and too little for a bail bondsman to be interested in lending. Uh, so there's a sweet spot uh, that, that the criminal justice system has organically discovered uh, that where if a judge uh, and the prosecutors decide uh, that they definitely want this person to spend their, to wait in jail to go to trial, uh, there's a number that they can pick out uh, that at 90 or 95 percent of the time is going to result in a person going and sitting uh, in a jail cell waiting, waiting for trial. But the most in, uh, insidious thing that I learned is, is this trick uh, that is used in many different states uh, to evade the speedy trial laws. Does everybody here know about the speedy trial laws to speedy trial rules? Um, well, for instance, in New York State, if you are charged with a misdemeanor, um, uh, officially they're supposed to bring you to trial or or somehow dispose of your case within 90 days. Uh, so you shouldn't, technically, you shouldn't be waiting in jail for, for longer than 90 days. 
But the prosecutors have found um, a kind of leprechaun trick uh, that allows them uh, to evade uh, this, this restriction. And what they do is, when the person has his, his or her first court date, uh, they will show up in court and they will tell the judge, Your Honor, we're sorry, but we're not ready to proceed today. And typically this is because they can't find a witness or the evidence isn't strong enough or whatever. Uh, the judge, whose calendar is always uh, you know, overstuffed and he doesn't have any time uh, for the next six, seven, eight weeks, uh, he says to the prosecutor, well, okay, in that case, let's reschedule for two months from now and uh, we'll, we'll see you again uh, at that point. Uh, the defendant, of course, is horrified because now that means he's going to have to wait in jail for another two months at least before something happens with his case. But the really insidious thing is what happens the next day. The prosecutor then files to the court a thing that he, that, uh, he or she calls the, uh, a certificate of readiness, uh, which basically says that while we were not ready to proceed yesterday, we are, in fact, ready to proceed today. Um, so if there was an opening on the calendar, we could proceed today. But of course, there isn't an opening on the calendar. There won't be for the next six, seven, eight weeks. And so the judge, the court, will only charge the prosecutors one day uh, uh, towards that 90-day speedy trial limit, um, as opposed to you know two weeks or six or seven weeks, and so in this fashion, there are people who are who await trial for misdemeanor crimes for a year, a year and a half, two years, more than two years, uh, and of course, in many of these crimes, the actual sentence, if you were to be convicted, is far less than the amount of time that you would spend waiting to have your case heard, and what happens? Uh, the prosecutor, as soon as they achieve this little trick, they will go back to the lawyer representing the defendant and they will say, well, how, how would you like to take a plea uh, for time served plus 10 days? Uh, and nine times out of 10, maybe even more than that, the defendant will accept that deal uh, because the alternative is, is, is unknown it, you know it, it, you, you have no idea how much time you might spend uh, waiting in jail to fight it out um, and so this trick essentially means that uh, all you have to do to win a case against the defendant who, do, who doesn't have enough money to bail himself out of jail is make sure that you survive the arraignment and that the charges go forward. And, and this is a powerful weapon that prosecutors have all over the, all over the country, uh, and not many people know about it. And it's not a factor, again, with white-collar offenders. Just to give you an example of how much it's not a, a factor with white-collar offenders, there was a famous case uh, back in the mid-2000s called Jen Ree. Um, um, and this was back when, uh, if you remember, Elliot Spitzer had uh, uh, Hank Greenberg, the CEO of a AIG, in his sights. Uh, this was the biggest corruption case in all of Wall Street. Everybody was watching this case, and it was a it was a stock fraud case that involved those two companies, AIG and, a, and a, another company called General Reinsurance. The prosecutor's strategy in this case was to go after the people from Gen Re, uh, and what they wanted was to convict uh, some of the mid to higher level executives of that company, uh, and then have those people roll on the real targets, who were the high level executives at AIG. Um, but they were in; they, they did not succeed in doing this for a number of reasons. First of all, um, none of them uh, had to spend any time waiting in jail for for, for trial. Uh, they, each time um, the, the question of bail came up, uh, they all had hundreds of people show up in court. They had people tell the judge that, you know, your honor, this person wouldn't even jaywalk, uh, much less commit a crime, even though the, the, the crime that the person was accused of was a $750 million stock fraud. Um, the judges listened to these appeals, but most importantly, um, uh, even after the state eventually won convictions against five uh, lieutenants in, in, from general reinsurance, the judge allowed them all to stay out of jail pending appeal. 
Um, so not only was bail not a factor, conviction was not a factor for this kind of defendant. And this completely undercut the leverage, all, any leverage the state might have had in going after the real targets. Uh, and of course, that, that prosecution never proceeded. Uh, subsequently, due to a ridiculous technicality where the judge basically got his dates wrong, uh, all five of those defendants were released on a technicality. And so nothing happened in that case. Uh, but, a, but a key factor was this whole idea of this kind of person, this you know, the, the, this pillar of a suburban community who's never been caught jaywalking before, we can't have that person waiting in jail for, for a crime that he may or may not have committed. That's not right. And the judges repeatedly, over and over and over again, make that decision. Yet when they're looking at another kind of offender, it's just by the book. They don't even, they don't even look up. Uh, you know, it's, they, they announce uh, an amount of bail, and the person goes in. And if he goes in, he stays in. The next issue that's crazy is repeat offenders. Um, there's no such thing as a, as a second chance for a, a certain kind of offender. I spent a lot of time researching this book, uh, talking to people who had been charged with welfare fraud, uh, because I was interested in how we treat that kind of fraud versus how we treated the fraud on Wall Street. Um, once you're convicted of welfare fraud, that's it. You're never going to be in the system again. You can never apply for public assistance again. Members of your family uh, may or may may not uh, lose their benefits as well. They, if they're on Section 8 housing, they may lose uh, their ability to, to get assistance from the government. You lose your ability to get professional licenses um, uh, of all kinds. In New York State, if, you're, if you have a certain kind of conviction on your record, you can't even work in a pet cemetery. Um, New York State has a, a crazy anomaly, in fact. That, uh, while people are in prison, they train prisoners to cut hair uh, but it, it turns out when they get out that it's impossible for a convicted uh, felon to get a barber's license. Uh, so they actually train people for, for a profession, but then when you get out, you actually can't get the license to legally get that job. Um, contrast this with what happens with, with Wall Street cases. It's, the contrast is incredible. Uh, a lot of you may have heard of the HSBC case, uh, which involved a company that admitted to laundering money for sanctioned nations, laundering $850 million for a pair of Central and South American drug cartels. Um, HSBC had been sanctioned um, upwards of 30 times by uh, regulators before that deal where they were given a complete walk uh, by the government for admitting to laundering all that money for the drug cartels in Mexico. Um, they had had three different, uh, entered into three different agreements with three different regulatory agencies in which they had promised never to uh, engage in those activities again. And yet the fact that they were repeat offenders was not held against them. Them when they when they entered into this deal with the, this last deal with the government, uh, where which was essentially a deferred prosecution agreement, where basically they just promised not to do it again, again. Um, there was a story in the New York Times a couple of years ago where they talked about companies on Wall Street that admit to fraud and what happens when they admit to fraud. Uh, they found that there were 51 cases involving 19 different Wall Street firms who broke fraud statutes that they had already promised in previous settlements uh, not to break. Uh, so there are at least 51 cases of Wall Street firms that were caught violating agreements not to break fraud statutes and yet were let off, uh, allowed just to make the same promise not to do it again. Um, an, an example is Citigroup, which in, two, in the year 2011, they paid a $285 million fine to settle fraud charges, but they had been sanctioned for breaking exactly the same anti-fraud uh, statute in the year 2000, in the year 2005, in the year 2006, and the year 2010. Uh, and each time, they were allowed to get off just by making the same promise not to do it again. Um, and so there's this enormous dichotomy. And this, this doesn't even get into the question of why or were there no individuals ever brought to justice in any of these cases. Uh, but on the company level, over and over and over again, being a repeat offender is not a major factor uh, in, what, in the disposition of, of what should be criminal cases against these companies. A third thing is fraud uh, and the attitude towards fraud. Um, 
for welfare applicants again, I just sort of wanted to talk about what, what a fraud case is. What, how, do you, how do you generate a welfare fraud case? Because it's really interesting. Um, if you go in and apply for welfare in a state like California, uh, one of the things that you have to do is you have to fill out this sort of quarterly uh, report. And it'll, at the top, it says, you know, under penalty of perjury and under penalty of prosecution for fraud, I assert that. And there's a list of stuff that you have to attest to that's five or six pages long. It, it, it's, it's essentially a mini biography where you have to tell the state about all these different facts in your life. And what they're ostensibly interested in is, um, are you cohabiting with somebody? Do you have some other source of income? Do you own a car? Uh, do you have insurance that you're not telling us about? Um, or do you have assets that you're not telling us about? And so every quarter, if you're on public assistance, you have to go in and you have to sign this document that says, I promise that everything that I say in here is, is gospel and true. And as soon as you sign that document, that, that document goes into a big computer and all these databases start running, uh, running searches against your answers. And if any of them aren't right, then automatically a fraud case is generated against you. So essentially, you, you're, uh, a fraud case is something that, that can happen to you almost accidentally. You don't, you, you, it, it, merely because the state has the power to ask, to, to force you to swear to uh, all these different details of your life, whether or not you have a boyfriend, whether or not somebody's state has, uh, you know, a man has stayed over your house uh, more than once a week. Um, this, can be, this can become the genesis of a fraud case. And they strongly encourage neighbors uh, to rat on, on their, uh, on people who live next uh, next door to them, uh, that can become the basis of a fraud case. If you show up uh, for a meeting with your welfare uh, officer uh, and that person sees you get out of a car with a man driving, um, that might be the genesis of a fraud case. And you never win these cases. That, that's one, another one of the things that I learned about this this whole system is that once a case begins, there's almost no disposition except except loss uh, for the person who's charged with this kind of offense. Um, contrast this with, again, with the kind of stuff that went on in 2008 and the years pr pr prior to, the, to that. I could walk into any courthouse in this city and I could find you a prosecutable case of criminal fraud just by going through um, stacks of mortgages uh, and, and credit card lawsuits. Uh, because what you'll find, all you have to do is, you know, any one of you can do this trick. Go on to Google, uh, type in famous robo-signers, right? And you'll get a list of names of people who have been caught uh, essentially committing mass perjury uh, for uh, these, uh, some of these companies. And what they're, what they're basically doing is when they're suing people or they're, or they're trying to foreclose on people, they, you know, there are these uh, uh, affidavits that they have to swear to in, in the process of trying to foreclose or, try, or trying to collect on a, on a credit card lawsuit. And all of these affidavits are, uh, they, they swear that they have personal knowledge of the, of the case in these affidavits, but that's not the case. In fact, it's typically some low-level employee who's fresh out of college, and some senior executive comes and drops, uh, you know, four, uh, you know, 400 or 500 files on his desk. He signs each one of them, attesting that he has personal knowledge of the case. Then the case goes out into the world. People get foreclosed upon uh, on fake documents. You can find, all you have to do is find and look up the names of any of those robo-signers and go into any of these courthouses and cross-check uh, to see uh, if, if any of those files are in there. And you'll find them. You'll, it, it'll take five minutes for you to find one of those cases. They're everywhere, and none of those cases are prosecuted. And so that's that's another uh, an incredible dichotomy. And the last thing I sort of wanted to bring up was just restitution. Uh, again, if you get back to people who are committed with uh, or are charged with welfare fraud or or simple fraud uh, or with stealing a car or, or some other kind of street crime. What what's the percentage of restitution that that person is going to pay? Does anyone have a guess? It's 100%, of course. I mean, it's always 100%. Uh, you know, the, the single mother who's on welfare, who's, who's caught, uh, who maybe 
received $800 that uh, she wasn't entitled to. Uh, when her case goes forward, she always has to pay $800. Uh, that, that's at minimum. Uh, restitution is never less than 100% for your street offender, for your, for your uh, inner city urban offender. Uh, it's always the maximum. Um, I actually talked to a prisoner uh, who was sentenced under the Cal California's Three Strikes Program, who was sentenced to life in prison for stealing a $2.50 pair of tube socks. Um, and this person's uh, uh, restitution was not $2.50, it was upwards of $11,000. And he had to pay off that money by working in a prison cafeteria, which he did uh, for 17 years before his conviction was finally overturned. And at the time uh, he was finally released from prison, uh, he, was, he had still not paid off his debt. Uh, and so that's what restitution is uh, for uh, that kind of offender. But think about the restitution, think about the kinds of settlements that we've seen recently for other kinds of offenders, for uh, UBS, uh, which was given a, a $1 billion settlement, uh, one plus billion dollar settlement for its involvement in the LIBOR scandal. Uh, HSBC, $1.9 billion for uh, its role in the money laundering scandal. Uh, Chase, for a whole smorgasbord of stuff that they did that was, uh, you know, apparently, um, you know, uh, under the table, they got a 13 billion. Just one settlement was 13 billion dollars last year. They had, they paid 20 billion dollars in fines total, but. If you see $1 billion in fines for any of these companies, you can guarantee that the profits were $30 billion, there were $50 billion, and the same thing is true with pharmaceutical companies, with other kinds of companies. Restitution is never 100%, and it never comes out of the pocket of the actual individual. It's always from the company. Uh, and just to wrap up, one, the one last thing I want to talk about is, is collateral consequences, which is uh, this policy that was sort of in invented by uh, Eric Holder uh, back in the late 90s when he was just a, an official in the Clinton Justice Department. He wrote up a, a memo, which has now come to be known as the Holder Memo. And back then, it was considered a, a sort of get tough on crime document. This memo uh, gave prosecutors all sorts of interesting tools to go after corporate offenders, and uh, in fact, it enabled uh, a number of really interesting prosecutions in the early Bush years. But at the end of the memo, they had also laid out this policy called collateral consequences. And what collateral collateral consequences said was when you're th when you're thinking about prosecuting a big company that employs a lot of people, that is economically and systemically important, where there may be innocent victims, shareholders innocent executives, um, people who, didn't, who weren't involved in the crime, you may consider other remedies uh, besides criminal prosecution uh, when you're looking at that company. It basically just gave, it just gave prosecutors permission to not proceed with a criminal case. Um, and this is, this is sensible. You don't necessarily want to destroy a company because a couple of bad apples at the top of the company may have done something wrong, um, you know, in, in the case of Enron or Arthur Anderson, which was criminally charged. There were a few people who worked with Enron who decided to shred a couple of ton tons of documents and they charged that company criminally and the company went under and 27,000 jobs were lost and from that point forward the government became very skittish about charging any kind of company. But now it's gone beyond that. Now we're not only not charging companies, we're not charging individuals from these companies either. And Collateral Consequences was written in 1999, long before the age of too big to fail. When Eric Holder came back to office, it was in the middle of the financial crisis and too big to fail was a new reality and now he was literally surrounded by a, ser a group of companies where if they were to proceed criminally against them, there, were, there really would be serious ramifications for the economy. There would be unknown numbers of innocent victims. And so this has become the official, uh, the semi-official policy of the United States government with regard to these companies now, which is that we, it, when we're dealing with a company, even when it's HSBC and they're admitting to something as awful as washing money for narco-terrorists, um, we will pursue alternative remedies other than pr criminal prosecutions um, because we have to, we're, we're now going to consider the collateral consequences. Now that policy in a vacuum, it makes a lot of sense, but there's two big problems with it. The first thing is it should only happen once. Um, if you're going to let a company off 
because they're too big, because they're too systemically important. Um, Part of, the, part of the agreement should be you have to break up and you have to, and you have to make yourself smaller so that the next time you wash money for a narco-terrorist, we can throw you all in jail. Um, and this is exactly what the government has not done uh, in the years since the financial crisis. That's the first thing. And the second thing is we don't consider the collateral consequences when we go after individuals who commit, who commit far less serious offenses uh, in street crimes uh, when we decide to proceed against that single mom on welfare who again and nobody's saying that person shouldn't be punished but when we proceed against these people it has far-reaching ramifications for everybody in their family I mean it may, it may result in her, her mother losing her section 8 housing it may result in homelessness for some of her relatives she may lose her kids that's a frequent uh, end result of a lot of these prosecu prosecutions is that people who are criminally charged get separated forever from from their children um, and we've decided that it's okay to consider Consider the, the collateral consequences for a certain kind of defendant, and it's less okay to consider it for another kind of defendant. And I think everybody, when we think about this, I think most people, there are not that many people who would say that this isn't wrong. But the problem is we don't think about it anymore. And, I, and, and the reason I, I really wrote this book is because I, I wanted people to, to, to wonder whether we, we would actually reach this psychological moment in our history where we've just decided to accept it. And if you think about you know, going back to the Bush years, you know, when they went after Tyco and uh, Delphia and WorldCom and, and all those companies, even George Bush and even that Justice Department recognized this, the psychological necessity of going after those companies so that people would feel that justice really is blind and that nobody's, nobody really is above the law and that if you break the law and you cause ma major social damage, um, it doesn't matter who you are, you're going, we're going to at least try uh, to, to bring you to justice. And what's happened now, and, and what I think is the really scary part, is that we've, we've decided that it's no longer important to even keep up appearances. And I wonder whether, whether that's a psychological change in all of us, uh, whether we've just come to accept uh, this, this possibility, and, and we've just come to accept the reality that jail is for some people and, and fines are for other people. And if that's the case, um, then we've entered a very dangerous period of our history, and, and I hope uh, that we we can do something about it. Um, so thank you so much for, for listening to me tonight, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions. So we, we're going to open the floor to your questions. If you can raise your hand and just wait for one of my colleagues to bring you a mic, that would be great. So does anyone in the audience want to kick us off before we turn to Twitter? All right. Oh, over here. Okay. Um, right here in the front, there's a, a gentleman with the pink tie, and then we have another one right next to him. Okay, so for all of us middle class people, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, who aren't, who aren't poor, and we think that those poor people should be cheating, and with the big people that we don't really circulate with them, and so what do we do? Well, I, I just think that, well, first of all, uh, I, th I think this problem applies to everybody. I mean, I, it, it, whether you're middle class or not, um, you know, one of the chapters in my book uh, talks about a, uh, a saxophonist in New York uh, who got caught up in the stop and frisk policy and uh, was severely beaten by police. Uh, in the old days, they would never have gone after that kind of person before. They would never have made that kind of judgment. Uh, but this statistics-based policing policies that we're seeing now, they're running out of people uh, to, to arrest. And so they're expanding the kind of person uh, who is becoming a target for these sort of frivolous arrests. There's a sort of epidemic, what they call it, in, some, in, in Baltimore they called it an epidemic of false arrest. And so you're starting to see all these people uh, busted for things like riding the wrong way down a sidewalk, uh, carrying an open container, um, uh, you know, jumping a turnstile at a, sub, at a subway station. I'm not saying that you would do that, of course. I'm just saying that once upon a time, police only arrested people for those kinds of things in certain neighborhoods. Now they're fanning out into other neighborhoods and doing that. And I think everybody has to be concerned about that. But the second thing is just on a moral level, it should bother everybody uh, that that this in, that these injustices go on. And, and, and 
if you think you know being middle class uh, that this doesn't affect you when when Wall Street uh, you know is is let off uh, for major crimes, um, you know I would suggest that you look at your pension to see what what happened in 2008. Um, you may have lost an, an awful lot of money. Uh, the price of aluminum you should check. Uh, the the interest rates and the LIBOR scandal. There's all sorts of things that you may not be aware of that you're you're being victimized by, uh, and so this is it's important for everybody to stay on top of these issues. I think. Um, we'll we'll turn to the gentleman right next to him who had his hand up first. Stephen Graham from California. Uh, do you think that the Blackstone securitization, Blackstone bought 38,000 houses, and they're now taking all of the rentals and security them and selling those as individual debt. And do you think there's a possibility of the same kind of fraud arising in the Blackstone situation? Blackstone's that big hedge fund. Right. No, I know what Blackstone is. I'm just not familiar with that with that particular case, so I, I don't think I should comment on it. But I mean, certainly there was plenty of fraud, securitization fraud that went on, and there's been almost no criminal prosecutions of any of it. In fact, I can't think of one. Um, there have been a number of civil suits for securitization fraud, but uh, I, I can't think of a single criminal case involving that kind of fraud. I'm going to uh, turn to a question from Twitter from Christy Willard. Um, what uh, did you hope to achieve with your book, and what change can we affect against uh, Wall Street conglomerate? Again, I, uh, it's a great question. Th thank you for the question. Um, I, I, I just wanted to start a, a conversation about these issues with, with this book. I, you know, I, I was, I was very fortunate uh, to have been um, involved in the Occupy movement in, in a very sort of tan tangential way. I, I think some of the articles that I wrote uh, resulted in some some of the protests. Um, and I, I this time around, I, I, what I just would hope that people would look at these issues because one of those one of the things that I found out when I was doing this research is that these two worlds don't intersect very much. There are, there are not many people who, who are in this cycle of endless uh, harassment and arrests who also know a lot about what goes on on Wall Street. And there aren't a lot of people on Wall Street who know very much about the 2.3 million people who are in prison. And so it's a, it's a problem that's got kind of gone undetected uh, in, in most of America because nobody is really seeing both uh, issues at the same time. And so that was that was a major mission of this book was to try to show regular audiences both sides of this of this issue. Um, and we're going to go uh, Lisa Thomas with the red sweater on. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, going back to the collateral consequence, consequences that you spoke about uh, and the people who are in jail because they can't afford bail and then end up making these deals, are there any statistics about how many of these people are actually innocent but they think that this is their best case scenario and so they take a deal but the consequences now that they've got a criminal record that follows them forever? Yeah, no, I, I don't... I don't have a whole lot of, um, I don't have any statistics on how many of those people are actually innocent. Um, I have met people who claim to be innocent and claim to have taken deals um, uh, be because of those pressures. Uh, I imagine it happens all the time. Uh, but um, to me, it's actually, you know, it, it's funny. I talked to the head of the Innocence Project in Stanford, and uh, this is the, he was the person who helped overturn the, th the th three strikes policy in California. And he said a thing, something to me that I thought was very profound. He said, people get so hung up on uh, innocence and guilt. Um, we, said, we have to uh, worry about whether we're treating the guilty the same way. Uh, and I think you know, the, a major lesson of this book is that even if these people are guilty, even if they're, even if they're waiting in jail just to be convicted, um, the, the fact that they're receiving a different kind of treatment than the other, the other defendant is already a major injustice and and it's a, it's a serious problem so I mean I guess that that's the only answer I can give to that uh, I'm gonna go over here uh, Justin uh, he's right, right in front of you there you go <laughs> hi uh, thanks uh, you obviously made a lot of great points um, but um, I guess my the biggest question is collateral consequences is obviously a, a complex issue mm -hmm. and I'm I'm not looking for any easy solutions but um, do you have any guesses, at least? Uh, what, what an easy solution to that might be? No, at, at <laughs> what, like, just some possibilities might be for addressing collateral consequences. I mean, 
I, I think I think collateral consequences per se. First of all, the, the question is, uh, you know, what's what's a potential solution for collateral consequences? I don't think the policy per se really has to be changed. I I, I think the the problem is is that it's being used. Uh, there's a sort of slate of hand trick that they're using, where they're where they're invoking collateral consequences as an excuse to not go after individuals. Collateral consequences was a policy that was designed to prevent destructive criminal prosecutions of companies. Uh, and that's why we haven't seen major prosecutions of companies in this country. Uh, I, this, my book opens up with the prosecution of a bank uh, in New York City called Abacus Federal Savings Bank, which is the first bank to be indicted in America in over 20 years. And it's not a too big to fail bank, it's this little tiny Chinese community bank between two noodle shops uh, in Chinatown. And the reason that they proceeded, uh, they, they indicted this company is because there was political pressure to indict a bank. Uh, and this was the small, this was as small as you had to be uh, for them to feel comfortable indicting a company. Um, and so uh, there are two things. One, don't use, as, uh, use collateral consequences as, as an excuse to not indict in, individuals who commit serious crimes like money laundering. And two, when you get a company that does get off uh, for, uh, thanks to collateral consequences, that company has to be broken up into smaller pieces uh, so that, and, and incidentally, that doesn't, that's not going to require an act of Congress is not going to require a public, uh, you know, agitation. That's just going to, the Department of Justice can do that all by itself. It's just as in, in writing the agreement, they can demand those changes be made. And um, I, I think that's, it would be important for that to happen. I think that would be a great leap forward. Uh, I saw Meredith in the middle. Criminal justice reform advocates, such as uh, the Pew Charitable Trust, have often had the most success in terms of advancing their policy change agenda by not arguing the human rights component, which mm -hmm. you've mostly spoken to tonight, but um, kind of meeting audiences where they're at in terms of this makes the most sense for your community financially. Um, how did you grapple with that in terms of writing your book? And do you maybe feel that as a journalist, it's your responsibility to tell the human side and let nonprofits or other advocacy groups you know, argue that financial, shore up that financial argument. So that's a great question, and I and, and I get that question all the time. And 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 uh, a typical way that that question is posed is, um, you take such issue with the HSBC settlement, but the government got 1.9 billion dollars in that settlement, and think of the good that you can do with that 1.9 billion dollars. Um, would you really rather see one of the executives from that company go to jail? Uh, would that do? any more good uh, than, than getting $1.9 billion? Um, and that's, that's a legitimate question to ask. That's, that's certainly not a, a, a silly question. But it's not a pragmatic issue for me. This is a moral issue. Uh, and, the, and it's a moral issue because if there's one group of offenders um, that is able to escape jail simply because they or their company has the capacity to pay a big fine, while another group of offenders has to go to jail because they don't have that capacity, then justice no longer works. Uh, it's, it's a moral issue, and people lose faith in the criminal justice system when that kind of situation happens. And so I, I understand the pragmatic argument. I understand that, yes, you can, when, when JP Morgan Chase pays $20 billion in fines. Think of the things that we could do with that money. Um, but it doesn't work. I mean, it's, it's, it's not convincing to the person who's doing time uh, for a far less fr frivolous crime. Uh, what, good does that, what, what good does it do that person uh, that, that JP Morgan Chase paid $20 billion? Uh, you know, it, it, so to me, I get the argument, but it's, it's, it's more important to solve the moral issue. Uh, we only have time for one more question. I saw the guy with the blue jacket in the back and have his hand up for a while. Hi, Matt. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. Uh, in your first answer, you touched on the individual impact of a lot of these issues, whether it's foreclosures as a result of auto signatures or uh, the impact of, of fraud to shareholders. Mm -hmm. In your remarks, you talked a lot about the government's reticence to prosecute 
Is there precedence for or an opportunity for some sort of individual class action that might have more impact on the decisions of these companies? Oh yeah, they're, they're, that's a great question. And we are seeing lots and lots and lots of individual class action lawsuits. And, and those, those lawsuits have been very successful in, in obtaining relief for victims. Um, and in many cases, they've even succeeded in changing, uh, at least in part, the way some of these companies do business. Um, but for the most part, it's really just they're really just getting some money uh, and they're not really they're not changing uh, fundamentally uh, or addressing the problem I mean a great example there there have been uh, settlements obtained for instance against the ratings agencies uh, recently the ratings agencies played an enormous role in the financial crisis because uh, they bowed to pressure uh, from big financial companies who pressured them into giving better ratings to batches of subprime prime mortgages than they deserved. Uh, and the reason for that was because of this model that they work under, whereby it's called the issuer pays model. In other words, uh, the ratings agency is compensated by the company uh, that is asking for the rating. So if, you know, let's say a bank uh, wants to rate a bunch of mortgages, uh, they will go to a ratings agency and say, here's a bunch of mortgages. We would like 80% of it to be AAA, and by the way, we're paying you, so you know, you know, think about that as you're rating the, the, uh, uh, this batch of mortgages. Well, a lot of people sued, a lot of towns and cities sued the ratings agencies for their role in, in helping convince some of these communities to buy fraudulent batches of, mor of mortgage-backed securities, um, but the, there still is an issuer pays model on Wall Street, and the rating the, the, these agencies still make their money the same way. So uh, while there have been a lot of class action lawsuits that have targeted these companies and that have obtained a lot of relief for individual victims, I, I would say that in, in most cases they haven't been terribly effective in, ch in, in, in affecting change. Well, I hope you guys will all join me in giving Matt a round of applause and a very big thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we actually, we have a thank you for you. I see that you wear a lot of hats in a lot of your photos, and, and so we have a Chicago Council hat, which invites you to have a global affair in the back. That's awesome. <laughs> thank you. And we actually drew two names out of the raffle for tonight that will win free hats. Those went to Hitesh Bawada and Renata Jones. And the winner of the uh, complimentary copy of Matt's book with a pass to go to the front of the signing line is Sean Harder. So thank you guys for coming out tonight. If you guys uh, won something, you can get it up at the uh, signing desk. So we'll see you at the next program. Thank you so much. Thank you.